welcome to Rivers in the Desert, a revival ministry dedicated to bringing the living waters of God's love to a hurting and dying world. It is our desire as you listen to the following message that the Holy Spirit will fill you afresh and that you would be ignited into a fervency for Jesus. This is the day to be filled with the knowledge of His glory as the waters cover the sea. God is doing something new on planet Earth today, and you and I have the great privilege to be a part of it. We love you. Be blessed. Numbers 9.15. Now on that day the tabernacle was erected. The cloud covered the tabernacle and the tent of the testimony. And in the evening it was like the appearance of fire over the tabernacle until morning. So it was continuously, the cloud would cover it by day, the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was lifted from the tent, afterward the sons of Israel would then set out And the place where the cloud settles down, the sons of Israel would camp. And the command of the Lord, the sons of Israel would set out, and all the command of the at the command of the Lord they would camp as long as the cloud settled over the tabernacle, they remained camped. Even when the cloud lingered over the tabernacle for many days, the sons of Israel would keep the Lord's charge and not set out. If sometime the cloud remained a few days of the tabernacle according to the command of the Lord, they remained camped. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. If sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, when the cloud was lifted in the morning, they would move out. And if it remained in the daytime and at night, whenever the cloud was lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year, that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it, the sons of Israel remained camped and did not set out. But when it was lifted, they did set out. At the command of the Lord they camped, at the command of the Lord they set out. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. Hallelujah. So the other idea for the global positioning satellite system, hallelujah, GPS, or when we need to leave and when we need to stay, is in chapter 10. The Lord spoke further to Moses saying, make yourself two trumpets of silver hammered work you shall make them and you shall use them for summoning the congregation having for the camp set out so the shofars or the trumpets would be blown Hatsurah here would be blown when the camp noticed that the cloud was moving verse 5 when you blow an alarm the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out when you blow an alarm the second time the camps that are pitched on the south side shall set out alarm is be blown for them to set out When convening the assembly, however, you shall blow without sounding an alarm. The priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets, and this shall be for you a perpetual statue throughout your generations. And when you go to war in the land against, in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall set out an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from your enemies." Now, if you notice, brothers and sisters, that this command was not taken care of too very much because, you know, we follow the biblical pattern, things happen. It wasn't until Gideon came about and sounded the alarm with the 300 that God destroyed all the Midianites in one night. So, you know, there's a certain biblical precedence that we see, and when we don't follow it, God is not able to do things for us. Now in verse 10, also in the days of your gladness and the appointed feast, on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder of you before your God, I am the Lord your God. So we see here that there's a command to sound the trumpets, hallelujah, 
And we see that this is not just an Old Testament principle, but in the New Testament, the seven trumpets of Revelation began the wrath and the tribulation period upon earth. Now it goes on in chapter 10 and verse 31, and we're talking about tonight the transition. Then he said, please do not leave us in so much as you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will be as eyes for us. So it be, if you will go with this, it will come about that whatever good the Lord does for us, we will do for you. Thus they set out for the mountain of the Lord three days' journey, with the ark of the covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Hallelujah. Now I want you to stop here and understand that this cloud hovering over the camp is coming back in manifestation. Keep your finger here and go with me to Isaiah chapter 4. As we put together this riddle, hallelujah, of the end time prophecies of this age. Isaiah chapter 4. We see this again symbolic of before the church is taken out, before there is a snatching away, before we return with Jesus back to planet earth, with glorified bodies, hallelujah, we see that this positioning, this global positioning system, this fire, hallelujah, by night, and the cloud by day will come back in manifestation. That's why I'm hanging everything, hallelujah, hanging my hat on this hook. I've read it in the scriptures, and I'm more excited than a mouse in a cheese factory. Glory to God. I can talk about this for days without resting. I, I'm telling you, it's consumed me. And my job is to sound the trumpet. Now it says in Isaiah chapter 3, talking about God will remove certain leaders, okay? God will judge. Verse 16, God is upset with the, the attitudes of the daughters of Zion, their proudfulness, the, the, what, where they, what they dress in. And then chapter 4, it says, For that day seven women will take hold of one man, and in that day saying, We'll eat our own bread, wear our own clothes, only let's be called by your name, take away our reproach. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. And it will come about that he who was left in Zion remains in Jerusalem, who was called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. So you've been in our meetings before, you've heard us talk about this, it's okay to recap on it again tonight, that when there's a bloodshed in the land, the bloodshed in the land is when people reject the prophetic word of God. When people reject when God sends a prophet or a prophetess in their midst, the Bible talks about Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and all the bloodshed of Abel down to Zacharias will be required upon that city. So, you know, there's, God sends prophets and prophetesses all the time, when we reject them, the land becomes full of innocent blood, okay? And to purge the land of innocent blood is by two spirits. One is the spirit of judgment, and one is the spirit of burning. Now, the spirit of judgment is not cat catastrophic destruction, okay? Judgment is simply John chapter 3. You all, you all know John 3, 16, right? Well, what's 3, 19? Jesus is still talking, though. It's still red, red ink, Amen. And 319 is, and this is the judgment, that light has come in the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. Okay? So the judgment of God, you know, the verdict of God, the sentencing of God from his beam of seat, as he sends the light, you know, the light cannot overcome the darkness. Everything in a person's lifestyle is exposed, okay? And they have a decision to run to the light or run away from the light. Okay? And just the... the the way Sunday services have been run since I've been a Christian, I see pastors lowering the bar, lowering the standard to accept people in, okay? And uh, hey, you know, what are we going to do? Camouflage ourselves? I like the light. How about you? Hallelujah. <laughs> that was not planned, by the way. Hallelujah. Okay. A spirit of judgment is that God sends the light, the glory. Amen. And we have to be mature enough to say, okay, Lord, judge me. Amen. Amen. Judge ourselves, etc. The second phase, the tandem, is the spirit of burning. 
And the spirit of burning is used several times in the Bible, okay? It's used of the burning bush. Did Moses ask for a burning bush? No. It was a theophany, suddenly. That means if God wants us to get to this place, he's going to have to show us theophanies. It could happen tonight. You could have a dream. I've had dreams, series of dreams the last few nights, warning me about, you know, certain things that are coming. Hallelujah. Okay, the spirit of burning is also used in the tabernacle that they are commanded to keep the fire burning day and night in the tabernacle. The spirit of burning is also used, hallelujah, in the book of Psalms talking of a bridegroom like the sun rising in its strength, a bridegroom coming out of his chamber for his bride. It's the same word used uh, in the Septuagint which is found in Revelation, I want you burning hot or I want you cold. If you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So we see here there has to come about a remnant of people that are totally consumed, burning hot for Jesus. Amen? Glory to God. And then out of that, verse 5, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion. Now Zion is the church, that's you and I, okay? And the word here, create, is bara in Hebrew, which is only used three times in the Bible. In the beginning, God created. David cried out, created me a clean heart, okay? And third here. How many people want to be in something new that God creates? Amen? Amen. The same word that God created the entire earth, hallelujah, is the same word used that one day very soon, he is going to create over the church. This is before the tribulation, folks. This is before we're snatched out of here. Okay? He is going to create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies, okay? So there's going to be a plurality of this visitation. That's why this is pre-wrath. This is pre-snatching away. This is pre-apocalyptic, okay? This is now. Amen. It's happened in our meetings before. I want it to come back. Amen. Little clouds, fire appears. Hallelujah. Now it goes on and says... Folks, we've had the fire department come out, the fire marshal, okay? And stand there with all his fire uh, personnel in the parking lot watching flames on top of the roof, but no smoke. And stay there an hour, come in and out of the services, check everything, go up, go up on the roof to see what was going on. Amazed. Hallelujah. And it just happened to be when that happened, I was preaching on how God is going to burn the occult and pornography out of the church, not knowing that next door to the church was an adult bookstore. <laughs> okay, come on, folks. This is exciting. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies, that's plural, a cloud by day. Here it comes in again. The cloud's going to happen again. Even smoke and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a canopy. So we see in the last days that this global positioning satellite system, this navigational instrument, hallelujah, that God used for the people in the desert is going to appear again. And notice here it says over all that is going to be the glory of God, yet over the top of the manifest of the glory is going to be the canopy, which in Hebrew is chupa, which is the wedding canopy, the only place in the Bible this is used, okay? This, and glory to God, this is where Dalit and I, this is where Jewish couples, whatever, they make exchange vows under the chupa, okay? So when we talk about the flame by night, the cloud by day, the glory of God, it all, some summation of it all is the wedding event. And look at the imagery of that wedding event, verse 6. And there shall be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day, a refuge of protection from the storm and the rain. Sounds like a Bedouin tent. That's cool in the day, but keeps out the rain and cold during the winter. In chapter 5, verse 1, let me now sing for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyards. Sounds like the Song of Solomon, doesn't it? Because it is. It's not Solomon's song. It's actually Shir HaShirim, the song above all songs. It is the bridal music. Hallelujah. 
So we see as people get closer and closer in love of Jesus and his return, there's going to come these navigational instruments kick in. Glory to God. Go back to Numbers 10. So Numbers chapter 10, I don't know where else you can get teachings like this. Hallelujah. Unless it's some Holy Ghost folks in China or India or somewhere that are totally on sync. We're all in the same flow. Because I don't hear this on the secular TV, the Christian media. So chapter 10 and verse 34, and the cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Then it came about when the ark set out that Moses said, rise up, kum, okay, it's the word kumi, rise up, O Lord, and let thy enemies be scattered, let those who hate thee flee before thee. Now, let's talk about this briefly. In God and his sovereignty, okay, nobody can, you know, you get a farmer's almanac, whatever, okay, but nobody can really judge when spring is about to begin, okay, or when the last frost is going to hit. That's all in God's sovereignty, okay? You can't really announce when a baby is going to be born, amen? So the, the same, God's sovereignty, that when he rises up, whoo, hallelujah, and the cloud begins to move, okay? When he begins to move forward, that's transition, right? And we've got to be people willing to move, amen? amen. We've got to be mobile. Come on. Hallelujah. We've got to be... Hallelujah. Amen? Yes. I mean, when the call of God comes, everything has to drop, and you have to follow. Amen. Okay. The purpose of God rising up is for war. Not just because he wants to go visit Mississippi. Yeah. And then next month we're going to go to Tennessee. Yeah. And then we're going to Argentina. And then we're going to come back to the smokehouse over here in Canton. Come on, folks. Yeah. God, his purpose for rising up, you say, okay, can we get a, a read, Lord? Why are you moving us this direction? It's for war. Yeah. Okay? Now, if anybody here has loved ones or you know of loved ones that have been in the, you know, the Georgia National Guard or whatever, and they're deployed in Iraq right now or Afghanistan. They're there for six months or a year, and they have no say-so about it, okay? No matter how much they want to spend time with their families, they have so, no say-so. If it's the commander-in-chief, right, has said, we are going to war. We're going to fight terrorism over there, lest our firemen and police fight it here, yeah. right? Yeah. And so there's great sacrifice that is, you know, played into that. However, you have to understand is that what God has called rivers and desert do is we just don't go places to do meetings, okay? Amen. I mean, if I had my choice about it, I would just stay here and just kick things open in Georgia, hallelujah, until either glory of God falls or we all get arrested. I mean, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But that's not happening yet. Why? It's because the cloud's been moving and God's been telling me, get out there. So just be praying for me, pray for my family, because we're being deployed to certain hot spots to sound the shofar. I mean, it is, it is so powerful how God brings us into Canada right before the elections. I mean, it's on and on and on and on. These things are going on, okay? God sends us to Oklahoma to preach that the fire of God is coming, to repent. And then suddenly the state, whole region is ravaged by a drought and fire. still going on right now. And the day we leave, it rains for the first time in many months. And then a rainbow appears and suddenly disappears. I mean, these things, and, you know, these, these things are not coincidences, okay? They're Christ's incident, okay? God is rising up and the transition is he wants us to go to places, okay? to attack, to be like 82nd, 101st Airborne, okay? We don't wait for the enemy. We go out there and we look for him. That's right. We probe and we look. We sound the shofar. We do meetings. Glory to God. Hallelujah. To stir things up. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Rise up, O Lord. Let thy enemies be scattered. God wants to scatter his enemies. Hallelujah. God wants us when we follow the cloud, is that we're not just going from one resting place to another. We're going to war. And if you study the pattern of the, of the, of the first you know, year or so that they're in the desert, not the 39 years, but the first year, God is setting them up 
into the different areas, okay, of Israel, probing to get the spies in there to attack. Woo! He comes up the southern route, you know, comes up. Some of us have been there, in the scent of Aziz, okay? And he sends the 12 spies in, okay? Glory to God. And it's so awesome there at night at that ascent, you know, where the 12 spies went in. Now down, down the road, you know, about 20 kilometers, you can see a phosphate chemical plant there. And, it, and the, the smoke coming out of the, the big, you know, steam at night, okay? From the, <laughs> from the boilers. And you, it looks like the pillar of flour. Remember that? By night. It's just incredible. Hallelujah. Just, just, you're just like, wow, this is awesome. Hallelujah. So well, I don't like war. Well, well, tough. We'll have peace on the other side of glory. Right now it's time for war, and God is moving to scatter his enemies, okay? And so who is the first people that are his enemies? Of course, those who are antichrist, okay? The false prophet, the false teachers, all that stuff, right? But what about this? When God says, uh, <laughs> if you're a friend of this world, you're an enemy of God. Are we men and women enough to swallow a mature message where God sends us to stir up the bottom of the rain barrel? And people think it's clear water, but it's sludge at the bottom and tell people you are a friend of this world system and you have become an enemy of God. And God has sent me here to sound the trumpet to warn you that you're going to spend eternity in a Christless region unless you repent and return back to your first love. Thank you for your enthusiasm on that one, folks. Come on. Is that not what the prophets did throughout the Old and New Testament, encouraging God's people to come back home? Amen? Come on, folks. I kept on looking at that this morning when I was preaching. I'll go ahead and read it to you. Is this, uh, let me just find it here real quick. It was kind of sticking out of my Bible. And it kind of reminds me if I should read it again to you. Are you ready? God has always had his specialist. whose chief concern has been the moral breakdown and the decline in the spiritual health of the nation or the church. Such men were Elijah, Malachi, and others of their kind who appeared at critical moments in history, okay, transitional moments, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort in the name of God and righteousness. Such a man or woman was likely to be drastic, radical, possibly at times violent, and the curious crowd that gathered to watch him work soon branded him as extreme, fanatical, negative. In a sense, they were right. He was single-minded, severe, fearless, and these were the qualities the circumstances demanded. He shocked some, frightened others, and alienated not a few, but he knew who had called him and what he was sent to do. His ministry was geared to the emergency. And that fact marked him or her out as a different man or woman. Woo! Set apart. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? If you know, during Martin Luther's Reformation, would you like to be in the middle of that Reformation or at the end? I don't want to be at the end. I didn't want to be in the middle. I would be right in the cutting edge, the front of it. Amen. Amen? And that's where we are right now, folks. We are in a Reformation right now. Glory to God. Some of you need to come on the road with me, take some vacation time, find out where we're doing meetings, come on out, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Anyway, so we go back here in chapter 10 and verse 35, rise up, O Lord, let thy enemies be scattered. Okay? So Moses would cry out this war cry when he saw the cloud moving. And the purpose was not to bring in the harvest, it was to, for God to attack his enemies. And that has not changed to this day. There are people out there that will never get born again, that are Alexander the coppersmith, that will do great harm to the kingdom of God's you know, efforts to go forward, and they must be exposed, they must be neutralized and stopped, they must be brought to justice. Are you all with me tonight? Amen. Okay, the second part, let those who hate thee flee before thee. There are people out there that hate the light. Yep. We can stop the service now and go to CNN or for a little five points, okay, go to the movie theater, and you start talking to mild-mannered people that look mild-mannered, okay, kind of preppy, okay, 
and you start talking to them about God, okay, and they're going to get give you a mouthful of hate. They don't hate us. They hate the message. They hate the exposure. That's something we've not built into our consciousness, how much God hates his enemies. Our job is to love them, okay? Walk in love. Judgment is God's, okay? So we see this going on. In chapter 11, we see the people start to complain after this. Okay? When the cloud moves, that's when the complaining gets the loudest. And I don't want to follow suit to my stiff necked relatives here. I don't want you to either. Now, the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. When the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of them on the outskirts of the camp. And the people cried out to the Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. I feel like that day is upon us, folks. Ananias and Sapphira's are coming back. Scenarios coming back in the church. Okay. So we see this going on here, okay? And, and I don't want to spend too much time here. It's all good. Hallelujah. But let's, let's go now to, you believe the cloud is moving, brothers and sisters. Yes. Let's go to Psalm 68 then. Yes. <laughs> if we believe the cloud is moving, then we need to get our camp broken down. Amen. Get the camels and horses ready. Get everything ready to move forward. And I'm talking about spiritually speaking. Glory to God. Now, 12, 14 to 03, I remember I was preaching on the same topic of Psalm 68. I wrote it here in my Bible about Saddam Hussein, and God began to speak to me. Because we had just returned from Israel, and God had spoken to us to blow the shofar and prophesy on the Syrian border for Saddam Hussein to be captured alive. And it happened, okay, the news broke when we were in Calgary at the days of all. And I love when that anointing comes. Anyway. Psalm 68 and verse 1, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered or splattered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let those who hate thee flee before him. There it is again. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be glad, let them exult before God. People say, oh, Brother Scott, that's Old Testament. We're in a new dispensation. I'm sorry, there is no dispensations in the Bible. God doesn't dispense himself differently, okay? <laughs> okay, what happens here is that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you read this and think that's ruthless, wait till you read the book of Revelation. Okay. Verse 3, let the righteous be glad, let them exult before God. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts. So when God rises up, when the cloud is moving, when the trumpets are blowing, that's why I wanted to play the shofar symphony tonight, okay? That the first thing that happens, glory to God, is that there is a song coming up out of your spirit. Hallelujah. Okay? If you look at the margin of the New American Standard, verse 6 says, the Lord, it says, lift up a song. It actually, excuse me, verse 4, it says, cast up a highway in the literal Hebrew. So the mechanized units of God, okay, glory to God, the divisions of mechanized armor that's coming in, which is his chariots of fire, hallelujah, there has to be a roadway, a highway, and they come in on the spontaneous praises of God's people. You catching that? So when we start to feel we need to worship more, okay, we need to spend more time in personal worship. We need to spend more time singing, you know, spontaneous songs of the Lord. Come on, how are people feeling that? What you're doing is you're laying the groundwork, the road work for God to come in, hallelujah, with his mechanized divisions of chariots. <laughs> General Patton, eat your heart out, hallelujah. 
We're talking about war, folks. And so there's been a lot of praise and worship, isn't there, in the body of Christ now? Come on, amen. Compared to 1940s, that type of worship, you know, kumbaya, my Lord, you know, whatever. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And have a healing service, you know, and sing something like that. Amazing grace. Everybody in place gets healed. And you go today, and you say, you know, God's, listen, God's, God's, sometimes God's moves slowly, but he does move. And so you have another generation coming up now, and we have all types of incredible music, you know. I like mountain music now myself. Hallelujah. Get past the little foothills, amen. Singing about the glory. I like to go right into the tabernacle and stick my head in the Ark of the Covenant. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. I like to trace my fingers upon the tablets, eat some of the hidden manna. Glory to God. Smell Aaron's rod that budded and feel the glory of God hovering over me underneath the cherub wings. Ooh, glory to God. That to me is true. But when, come on, the praise and worship is, is you know, as a, as a whole, the last 40 years has incredibly surged forward, has it not? Why is that happening? Because God dwells in the praises of his people and it's this construct it's this roadway unit we are casting up a roadway for god to move into the earth Amen. hallelujah keep on going okay verse five a father of the fatherless a judge for the widows is god in his holy habitation so god is coming in on the scene his mechanized units of calvary because he hears the cry of the orphan and the widow that's undefiled religion is to visit the widows and orphans. We need to find out if there's any orphanages in this county, or, okay? We need to if there's any nursing homes we can go to. I think there's one right over down the street here. Folks, I need your help to start doing some scouting patrols, okay? <laughs> start doing some scouting patrols and put that laser beam, infrared laser beam, on a spot so we can start sending the smart bombs on it, okay? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know about us going and finding places to visit. I'm sure every nursing home I've gone to in Street Witness over the years, they love it for us to come there and sing songs to them. They love it somebody visiting them. Yeah. And we got a captive audience. They can't go anywhere. Hallelujah. Yeah. And they, I, under, I bet if you get demon possessed and get wild at me, okay, but most of the time they're sweethearts. <laughs> they love to be prayed for. Amen. <laughs> God hears the cries of the people, the widows and the orphan. Somebody do that leg work to find those places, please. Verse 6, God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O oh God, will not us go forth before thy people. Thou dost march through the wilderness. Selah. The earth quaked. The heavens dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou hast shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. Thou hast confirmed thine inheritance when it was parched. Thy creature settled in it. Thou hast provided thy goodness for the poor, O God. The Lord gives the command. The women who proclaim the good news are a great army. So if we look back since 1989-90, okay, there was a transition in the world. The transition, God began to move freshly, and there was a huge rain that fell in the parched lands of Israel. It was a 50-year record. You can read our first book. It was do all documented in it, okay? But four years ago, it's four years now, there was another huge rainfall in the deserts, the parched land of Israel, which signifies to us God's doing a new thing, which is rivers in the desert prophecy. But it's more than just that. It is a movement of the glory cloud god going to war hallelujah and it says here in verse 11 the lord gives the command the women who proclaim the good news are a great army now king james says the lord gives the word great is the company that publishes it the word company there is nikiva in hebrew it means female messengers come on sisters smile tonight hallelujah So God gives the word, okay, and many times the sisters are given a word to speak, to command. Not everything all the women are saying is right, okay? 
But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about women, okay, that are crying out, the destitute, okay, the ones that are living in a parched land, the widows. Come on, folks, hallelujah. And as they're crying out and getting in tune with God and their, their own soul is parched, and when God starts to do something new, he gives the primary privilege of hearing the new thing to those people here at first. But not just hear it, they're called to proclaim it. Now, it's interesting, when God said, let us make man in our image, so he made male and female, he made them, Genesis chapter 2. He made him Zachar and Nikivah. He made him male and female. Female is Nikivah, okay? It's the same root, okay, for, or the tense for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the feminine side of God. Interesting, huh? Not saying the Holy Spirit's a woman, okay? But the Holy Spirit is the Nikivah tense, okay, of the Godhead. Don't try to read too much into it. Just understand what I'm saying is that sisters have that ability to hear many times from the Holy Spirit, amen, and able to be a radar, glory to God. And verse 11 says, and the, the women who proclaim that good news are a great army. And if you've noticed uh, the last 10, 15 years that um, there's been a great surge of women ministries, great surge of women, there is an army of women rising up in this hour. Come on, folks. Are you with me? Hallelujah. But let's look beyond that. It keeps on going. Come on. Verse 12, kings of armies flee. They flee and she remains at home, divides the spoil. So it doesn't matter if you have an executive job, okay, or if you're at home with, you know, changing diapers. Glory to God. You're involved in this army movement. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. This is exciting, folks. And then verse 17, the chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them at Sinai in holiness. So these chariots, this mechanized division that gathers together, their staging point is holiness. Okay? You'll never go wrong with the message of holiness and blamelessness. Okay? We've talked about that before in Abrahamic faith. Amen? And if you ever find yourself being swayed by the enemy... Okay, into compromise. The enemy is going after your faith. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Let me just show you something here. Keep, keep your hand right here, okay? Let's go to uh, Timothy. I just need to throw this out to you. I kind of have it rolling around inside of me. Whenever I see a believer start to say, well, you know, it's okay to watch those movies. Oh, it's okay to do this. Well, you know, I don't want to go to church that much anymore. Okay, as soon as you start hearing that, you know the devil's doofing them. Second Timothy, excuse me, Second Timothy, chapter two, and verse twenty-six. We're going to come back to this later tonight. Let me just briefly touch upon it now. In verse twenty-six, they may come to their senses, escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him, to do his will. So there is a secret improvised snare, okay, that are on these roadways. The enemy, enemy is trying to take us out. And I love the linguistic key to the Greek New Testament says that the snare of the devil to be held captive is these series of words, duped by evil influences. Okay? God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. If you give in to the pleasure of sin, you're going to be duped. There is a consequence, okay? Second, being duped by, come on, folks, are we not being, I mean, come on. I have to wrestle with my kids alone on a weekly basis to keep them from being duped by evil influences. The false kingdom down there in Orlando, making movies, going after our children's mind. Not even to mention the obvious fact of Harry Potter and everything else. And folks, I'm telling you, PG movies today, 10 years ago, would be rated R movies. So the enemy knows this. He's trying to dupe us, okay, by evil influences. And what happens? Number one, to numb the conscience. If you do not awake up to this, folks, you're going to be a casualty in this war. Right. 
People do not backslide overnight. It is a series of events over a long period of time that they eventually throw in the towel and decide, I'm going to live for myself. I don't want to live for God. I already have lived for God. God didn't answer my prayers. I'm mad at God. I'm mad at those people, whatever. And what happens is they fall right in the devil's snare. And it only takes a strong anointing and usually, you know, the fear of judgment to break them out of that downward spiral. I do this all the time, okay? Just like a dentist sees people's teeth every day. I, on a weekly basis, see people in the altar, okay? See people in church services where I know what happened in their life. And the sad thing, you can preach all you want, have all the anointing you want, but even people won't even listen to you. I mean, people, you know, the Bible says here in chapter 3, realize this, difficult times will come. People will become very difficult to deal with. Anyway, so it says, the devil comes by evil influences to numb the conscience. Whenever Paul stood before Agrippa, okay, or other Christians, he would say repeatedly, okay, what did he say? I have served God with a clean conscience. Yeah. Sure. Hallelujah. Keep your finger here. Go over here to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 Okay, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, what is that mystery? He's trying to hear, give instructions for husbands, okay, for deacons, for servants in the church. Look in verse 9, holding the mystery of faith with what? A clear conscience. I cannot, I have to live a crucified lifestyle. Actually, I like living it this way. But there's no high like the most high. Yeah, there's pleasures in sin, but there's more pleasures at his right hand. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Glory to God. I'm having more fun now than I've ever had in my entire life. This is not a legalistic message. This is, this is Bible. This is so simple, okay? The devil wants to skew your conscience. He wants you to think, oh, that's okay. I'm dealing with a situation now. You know, an in-law, okay? Acting like an outlaw. Okay? that has been living in a, a, a fornication, adultery situation for six years. I think she's okay. What a, you know, and she's raised in a Christian home. And then when I tried to speak into that person and tell her what she's doing is wrong, either marry the buffoon or get rid of him, okay? Oh, how the family gets all upset. Oh, you're being judgmental, you know, and I was like, please, give me a break. Come on, 50 years ago, that would have been totally unheard of to be allowed. Come on. That's what I'm saying. The bar, the sewer filth is coming out of the sewer system. Everybody's like, oh, it's, look, we got water in the streets now. That's wonderful. Let's build a recreation area. Not knowing what the source of that water is coming in. It's a tidal surge of filth coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Kurabashatai. Ho! I feel the fire of God. Amen. So you got to keep a clean conscience, okay? I don't know if you've ever been taught on that. I'm just now digging it out myself, okay? And in fact, when, I, when I was going to Bible school and I was raised in Tulsa, I went to church almost every night. Or we're out witnessing, okay? Or we're listening to tape series. I mean, we are all the time, nonstop. My dad once said to me, he says, you know, you study the Bible so much, if you would just apply that same zeal to medicine, you could become a brain surgeon. And I said, Dad, I am a brain surgeon. Get people <laughs> delivered of their natural mind. <laughs> he, does, he understands it now, but he's in glory, amen? But at that time, it was foolishness to his natural mind. Folks, I don't want to get duped by the devil. I used to serve the devil. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. I know what it's like to be in the dark room. Yeah. I know what it's like to be a messenger. Okay. Not just a, a drug user, you know. A drug pusher. Yeah. Making money at it. And when I got born again, whoo, hallelujah. Because one thing that always terrorized me is that those demons would come, and I, had, I, I could not stop them. They had a power over me. 
and I just was just a puppet. And now that I got born again, oh man, it's paid, it's paid, it's payback day. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, folks. I'm not a drug addict anymore. Don't look at me like that. Come on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people who exist their whole lives, okay, and don't even know that they're being molded and directed like a horse with a bit in its mouth by demon spirits. They don't know that this, these familiar spirits pass down through generations and afflict them like afflicted their father and the grandfather, okay? And they're caught up like a Greek tragedy. They don't know how to get out of it. But when you get born again, whoo! And those demons can't cross the bloodline. Come on. Of Jesus in your life. And now you become more than a conqueror. Glory to God forevermore. Woo! And so the devil can't, doesn't have any more. So now what does he try to do? He tries, to, he tries to dupe us. Drug us by evil influences. Folks, we, I don't want to do this for you, but take my word for it. We can all cancel the service, okay, and you listening. And we can go down. Let's go to the Cinemaplex, okay. Let's go to the Temple of Baal down there that has about 12 different services going on right now. And let's pay. Go sit in front of a big screen, okay, and watch different movies. Let's watch it, okay, for a month period. And tell me you won't come back with your conscience duped. I talked to a leading pastor here in Atlanta several years ago. He's not a leader anymore. He thinks he is. And I was telling him about certain movies. This is a spirit-filled pastor. Yep. Yep. One of the largest churches in Atlanta. Yep. I got into an argument with him at the diner one night. He got upset. He said, well, you, you can't tell people can't watch certain movies. And finally, the man with me interrupted and says, can I say something here? Pastor, you have no, if there's an adultery or fornication scene in that movie, you have no business watching it. Come on. Amen. He put his hand down and all stood, give me the bill. And to this day, he doesn't talk to us. I call those people sissies. Okay? Amen. They don't want to recognize their sin. Okay? Right. Yep. They lower the standard. And the only one who gets glory for it is the devil. And I don't like it when the demons laugh and mock Amen. at all the Christians in the first day hospital. Come on, folks. Come on. Amen. We're at war. The cloud's moving. Amen? Amen? And when the cloud is moving, that's the time to get your conscience back, not to get it seared. Come on. Go over here to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's read this again about the conscience. This is the battle, folks. You understand what your conscience is, okay? It's your seat of your emotions. It's that treasure box that God won't enter into. It's your will. It's your conscience. It's you, okay? God, that is off limits. Only God can be invited into that, okay? Actually, in the Hebrew, it talks about at times, lave, your heart. Other times, it uses the word kidney, okay? Other times, it uses the word loins, okay? And actually, the loins is actually was your kidneys in his back area like this right here. The very center of your muscular skeletal system. Think about it. Your balance, everything centered. You know, when, when you have back pain, everything whacked out. You know what I'm saying? That area, when you allow compromise to settle into the very balance of your whole system. Chapter 4, verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says in the latter times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own what conscience folks when when your skin is seared okay you can be drinking coffee okay and we get a point in your life where all your throat is seared and you can just drink down boiling coffee. Yeah. Won't even affect you. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. There's no sensitivity to hot or cold there anymore. Yeah. I refuse to get seared or frostbit by the evil doctrines of demons that are floating right now. We are in war. Hallelujah. And I like it. Glory to God. Because we win. I read that in the book. Amen. And the hypocrisy of liars. So people start getting involved in lying. You know what lying is? It's not really saying an outright lie. It's saying 
the first lie is, hey, listen, I'm okay. I'm okay. Oh, God's my buddy. You know, Jesus and I, you know, we're friends. That crowd is not going to make it. But you say, oh, you know, I love the Lord. And, you know, he saved me from the miry clay. I was nothing. Oh, hallelujah. He put my feet upon a rock. He's cleansed me. He's forgiven me. My guilt and shame is gone. Hallelujah. And I know now that dark realm, and I don't want anything to do with it. I want to keep my conscience clean. Come on. I can't even get mad at anybody in traffic and 400 anymore. <laughs> Amen. Come on, let's read it again. The Spirit, it, folks, this is, it expressly, clearly, this is such a, something we got to really meditate on. That in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience with a branding iron. The fruit of this is those who forbid marriage, Okay. Come on, folks, people that live together are already deceived in doctrines of demons. Yep. Yep. That's right. Oh. Abstaining from certain foods, okay? Kashrut, dietary food laws would be Seventh-day Adventist or Muslim or Jewish are the birth of doctrines of demons. That's right. Amen. Jesus said all things are created by God. Now, if I'm eating with an Orthodox Jewish person, I'm going to kind of eat pork in front of them because I want to win them. I don't want to offend them right away. I want to win them to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And there's certain things for lifestyle evangelism choices. Amen? Amen. Now, it's interesting here, folks. This is, this is awesome stuff. So let's go back now to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 26. I keep on hearing a foreboding in my spirit all week. I just, I keep on seeing 911 everywhere I go. Yeah. Yeah. I keep on seeing like 911 backwards. I mean, I just like, I feel this foreboding inside. Yeah. I don't know what's coming along the pike, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be ready for it. Okay, now, to be duped by evil influences. I've been held by the devil's captive influences before. Have you? I am about to fall in that same pit. Amen. I'm not about to, to know the way of righteousness and be like a dog returning back to its own vomit. Yep. Second Peter says. Okay, being duped by evil influences. Number one is to numb the conscience. I want my conscience to be so sensitive, amen? When I preach on TV and movies and stuff like that, most of the women are saying, amen, brother. It's usually the men in the services who don't say anything, get convicted. Who usually leads the causes for focus on the family and all these things are usually women, okay? Because the women are hearing something. Something new is happening. Come on, folks. Amen? Amen. Second, after numbing the conscience, what he, the, the devil does next is he confuses the senses. Oh, it's okay to drink that beer. Oh, the, the, the believers in Europe, they drink wine. Jesus drank wine. It's okay to drink that wine. Oh, it's okay to do this. Okay, first, let me just talk about wine real quick, okay? Especially for our viewers over here in Europe. Amen? Amen. I did a study on wine, okay? And I found out that the priests were commanded never enter the holy place at, when they drank wine. That's right. <laughs> Number two, Solomon's mother, and she should know, Bathsheba, okay, tells Solomon it's not good for kings to drink wine, okay, and, or give their ways unto women, okay? That was Solomon's big thing, okay? He started drinking too much wine, Ecclesiastes, he talks about it, and he got deceived by a bunch of foreign women, right? Yep. Yep. Also, I found out in Europe that the fermentation process for wine that is today being, you know, distributed was, this, was invented by monks in a monastery in France. Mm -hmm. yep. Much more toxic or much more higher percentage of alcohol, okay, than the wine produced in the Bible days. Yep. 
And also, when I drive past certain liquor stores in America and Canada, it says wine and spirits. Yep. <laughs> yep. Another reason why we should not be drinking wine or alcohol, because it's not, a, it make our brothers and sisters stumble. Okay? Just like cigarette smoking and other things like that. It, folks, come on. Flee every appearance of evil. Okay? But I think probably the, the thing that sears me the most is a testimony that Kenneth Hagin told us at Bible school where there was this woman that was in his church that she, she was a horrible alcoholic for many years. I mean, if you're going to be raised with alcoholic parents, I mean, phew, horrible alcoholic parent, okay? And she got delivered, got saved, praise God. And then she was clean for many years, serving the Lord, and went to a conference. And um, at this conference, many of the guest speakers were staying in the hotel, and the people in the conference were in the hotel. And she went down for dinner with some friends from church, and at the conference, they're all excited, talking about the teachings. They look over at the main table. Uh, at the head table, they see the guest speakers with other pastors, and they're drinking wine with their meal. And she says to herself, you know, I've been clean for a while. If they can do it, why can't I have a little wine? And she started sipping again, and a year later, she's a full-blown alcoholic, denied Jesus, left, whatever. And Brother Hagin said, I would hate to be that minister who used a little liberty, okay, cause another little one to stumble and it's in the regions of the dam. They have to stand before Jesus for one day. On one day because of that. But that's what the enemy does. He starts to numb your conscience. And then he'll start confusing your senses. Okay? And confusing your senses. Well, it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. Come on, folks. And the third area here, which is the most frightening, is paralyze your will. Even if you want to serve God... You're now like a heroin addict. There's a stronger urge inside of you than your own conscience. There is a driving force inside of you. You have become paralyzed. You cannot do your will. You're now being led along like a slave with a bit in its mouth, okay, by a demon spirit. Let's go back to Psalm 68. So Psalm 68 and verse 17 talks about the chariots of God were amassing. Now the, the next key event that happens in a transition when the cloud is moving, are you all getting something out of this tonight? Yeah. What we need to look out for is verse 18. This is a very exciting event here, okay? And that is, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captive thy captives, Thou hast received gifts among men, even among the rebellious, they may, the Lord may dwell there. Hallelujah. So at this moment of the staging point, and the women are going throughout the land, a great army, proclaiming that God's doing something new. Hallelujah. There comes an event that supersedes all previous events, and that is an outpouring of new gifts unto men. And this is where the government of God's operation goes into effect. And this is quoted by Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's turn to it. Ephesians chapter 4. Come on, folks. So what we see happening is new apostles and new prophets come about. New pastors, new teachers, new ministries are birthed. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. A lot of angelic activity going on around this church right now. I can feel it. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. This is where Paul quotes that from. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and gave gifts unto men. So this transitional point, God starts pouring out colonel bar, I mean, colonel <laughs> insignias and lieutenants and captains. Come on, hallelujah. Officers start being raised up, men and women. And it says here, whew, verse 11, he gave some as apostles some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, the building up of the body of Messiah. And the purpose he gives these new ministry gifts, okay, and they usually start out small in small surroundings like this, 
is verse 14. As a result, we no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and defeat, deceitful scheming. Nobody here likes to be ripped off when they go to the store and pay for something. Okay? In the same way we should not want to be ripped off in the current structure of the church. So these are very, these are very exciting things. Now, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and change gears tonight. Hallelujah! 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Actually, chapter 11 is the key point here. Chapter 11 and verse 2. And this is where I don't budge, folks. You'll have to kill me because I won't budge on this topic. Obey the speed limit out there. Anyway. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous with you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that to Messiah, I present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid lest as the serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Messiah. So you know you're in that place that your conscience is pure and clean, where you don't need other innocent amusements to attract you, okay? You don't need other extracurricular activities to rule your life, Okay? That you're content serving at his feet. Glory to God. You're content. You're in love with him. Woo, hallelujah. There's a simplicity that comes back to your life. Mm -hmm. And we must teach and train our children this way. Amen? Amen. The simplicity and purity of devotion. And notice here that the enemy, the serpent has come in. How many, how many of you guys like snakes? You like snakes? It's okay if I bring a snake in here? No way, I kill it. Amen. <laughs> Notice here, Paul says, Afraid us as a serpent deceived Eve. I think a great imagery of this when I was a kid was watching that old movie called The Jungle Book. And where that kid is in the tree and that snake comes up and starts, you know, like hypnotizing him and slowly numbs him. Remember that? That's what this world system is like. It's not always a frontal assault. It's a slow ebbing against our conscience, okay? That your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Messiah. Okay, so those that, that allow people to flow in this, okay, to always entertain people, what happens next, folks, is verse 8. They begin to rob churches. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Verse 13, for such men are false apostles and deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. And this is what we're saying by deceitful workers, okay? Angels of light. Don't put it off in the future. It's happening now. Yeah. And the only way to rescue yourself when push comes to shove, is your conscience. Mm -hmm. Amen. But you're filling in your conscience, your eye gate, your ear gate, okay, in with lots of evil influences, you're going to have a hard time discerning what is the angel of God and what is an angel of light that's disguised itself, okay? And then you're going to get critical and judgmental toward me for preaching a message like that, saying I'm being too hard. Yep. How y'all doing out there? Let's go to chapter 12, verse 1 now, okay? So we see in the transition that Satan is going to throw his best SS Nazi troops against us, okay? He knows the war is lost. There's no way for it to be won, okay? So what does he do? He throws out a counterattack, which in World War II was called the Battle of the Bulge, okay? To do his best, okay? to stop the Allied troops before they reach the Rhine River. Because once they cross the Rhine River, Germany is finished, okay? Yep. 
and tried to buy himself enough time so he could eventually get the Nazi secret weapon, the nuclear weapon in operation. And Hitler would have used it on England and other places very quickly. Hello, folks, come on. Okay, so the enemy is throwing an attack. And just because we live in beautiful Georgia here, doesn't mean there's not a major attack going on. There is a major attack going on right now by an enemy that has no conscience. And all you have to do is go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., or go to Israel, Jerusalem, and see, the whole, and see how the European people became duped by evil influences, okay, whose conscience became confused, their senses, their will became paralyzed, and allow not just six million Jews to be killed, okay, but five million other immigrants, okay, and, and, and gypsies and Catholics. Come on, folks. Eleven million people. And that point in the Holocaust Museum, you see all these different things being to break out, okay? And then the turning point, the night before the breaking of glass that started the Nazi, you know, final plan, so to speak, to be birthed and, and the public in Germany and, and Austria and Switzerland began to really push forward with this, was there's a saying by a German philosopher, it says, a nation is not known by what it does, but what it, by, by what it tolerates, People that were on the forefront of the Reformation. They could sit in their church service singing, Mighty fortresses are to be holding to evangelical doctrine that you and I believe in, okay? And to hear the sounds of the cattle cars going by on Sunday morning and the Jewish people and whoever else in those cars screaming out, Help us! And to numb their conscience to it. If it could happen 50 years ago, who says it can't happen today again? And it's happening in our culture. People, neighbors came and look at you. People are isolated. People are not even friendly. Come on, people. And so we see we're on a frontal attack right now. We are in war, brothers and sisters. And, it's, and then you just pile on top of that, this madman in Iran, okay? Okay, so what are we going to do about it? We don't, we don't have to wait for more warnings, folks. Amen. So our job individually is to check up on our conscience. Amen? Put in the oil stick, okay, and see if you're low. <laughs> okay? See how clean and dirty that oil is, okay? And do something about it, amen? Rotate the tires, flush the radiator, do what's needed, amen? Do some self-maintenance, glory to God. Hallelujah. And as you do that, get your conscience clean and pure, you're going to be caught up in this updraft of this huge transfer, uh, transitional movement God is doing. You're going to start, if you've been faithful, God will say, okay, there's an apostle, there's a pastor, there's an evangelist. Okay, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> because it's not based on your giftings. It's based on your conscience. That's right. Amen. Amen. Sure. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. So chapter 12, verse 1 kicks in. Well, actually, chapter 11, let's read this go in, in sync with this morning's message. Verse 23, are you all ready for this, folks? This is pretty hardcore, okay? 11.23 of 2 Corinthians, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I more so. In far more labors, far more imprisonment, beaten times not number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews, 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, night and day I spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there's a daily pressure upon me concern for all the churches. There has to be somebody on the point, okay? And sometimes the cutting edge is the bleeding edge, okay? There's got to be somebody on the point that takes upon them 
the brunt of the reproaches of Christ, as we talked about this morning, and go outside the camp, outside the gate, and bear the reproaches of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I guarantee you, you start living with the right conscience, you will automatically attract to yourself the reproaches of Christ. People will reproach you, but you shine so bright, they don't like it. Glory to God. And all I say is burn, baby, burn. Hallelujah. Let it burn. So chapter 12, now coming with all this persecution is divine revelations. And it says here, I go on to visions and revelations, chapter 12. I know a man in Messiah who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know. God knows such a man was caught up into the third heaven. Be prepared for theophanies. Be prepared for the glory of God to visit you in the night hour. Be prepared for things to happen to you, hallelujah, when you have a clean conscience. And such a man with a part of the body, God knows, verse 4, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words or rhemas which man is not permitted to speak. Awesome, folks. Hallelujah. So my job as a minister is to serve you. My job is to get out of the way and let that service going on in heaven download into this service. And what I hear in my prayer time, my Bible study times, my early morning manna waiting times, is I hear a lot of troop movement going on upstairs. I hear the chariots of God in, in operation. Hallelujah. I hear things happening. I hear a transition in happening. Amen. And so chapter 12 and verse 7 kicks in. Because there's a passing greatness of these revelations, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. So Satan saw that Paul became a transitional person. Remember? Folks, listen, if it wasn't for Paul, the Gentiles may have never got into the church. And boy, was he persecuted because of that. Amen? Yeah. I entreated the Lord three times. This demon came after him. This angelios, this fallen angel, okay? And he says, I, I got to get this thing out of me. Get it away from me. And God says, come on, boy. <laughs> this is, don't you understand? <laughs> when the devil says, check to you on the check the chessboard. I got it all planned out. I go jump, 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 checkmate. Hallelujah. You're the bait to bring the devil out that I may win. Yeah. <laughs> You're the bait in the trap. <laughs> and verse 9, my grace is sufficient for your power is perfected in weakness. What weakness are we talking about? I never said this before publicly. Let me tell you, the weakness of a pure conscience not standing up for yourself. I'm not telling you to be a carpet, okay, and let people run over you, but there's certain things that you don't have to argue about. There are certain things you don't have to demand for. There are certain things you don't need to get your anger flared up about. You just need to turn the other cheek. Because when you walk in a clean conscience, come on, folks, you can't even start, you can't even think bad about somebody. And that weakness makes you vulnerable. Yet that's when God comes in stronger in your life. Yes. I wouldn't be surprised that most cancer, okay, comes about because of people's strife and division, unforgiveness. Yep. How about this? I, I like to do a study on how many people have been through horrible divorces or court cases, fighting one another like two dogs fighting in, a, in an alley at night, you know, over who gets custody of the house, you know, or the kids, whatever, and to see what happens at the end of their lives if they didn't die of some type of disease like cancer or something. Yep. Yep. You know, folks, let me tell you, it will take a toll on you. Turn the other cheek. Let them have everything. Come on. Think about it. Don't stand up for yourself. Let God fight your battles. Let God fight. Come on. That's for somebody out there. Not for me. I don't know who it is. Maybe you had a business partner that did you wrong, okay? That short-ended you. Okay, and you're taking him to court right now. 
You better watch out. It's going to affect your blood pressure. You're going to be able to sleep at night. You're going to get that thing built inside of you, and the devil's going to play heyday with you. You're going to harden your conscience. Now, let me tell you something else, okay? And you can get mad at me. That's fine. I love you, okay? But I was at, I was at the church of, of, uh, last, last week at, in Oklahoma, and uh, the church is made up of a lot of ex-drug addicts and, and Holly Davidson type crowd, okay? And um, I saw these guys that were so possessed by demons, so set free. Hallelujah. Hardcore drug addicts just severely in love with Jesus. And they're, I mean, they're so humble. They're so loving. They're so soft. And, uh, and, not a lot, and, and, and they're, they're maintaining their fire for God. They're not in there because they're afraid they're going to get arrested. They don't go through the drug rehab program. They're going to be thrown in prison, you know. They're not in there but trying to be a good boy, okay? And then four years later, you revert back to their lifestyle. They're really solidly on fire. They love it, okay? And I pulled in one night, and I noticed there was no Harley Davidson or any motorcycles in the parking lot. And normally with that crowd, that'd be staple transportation, okay? And so I went, I was talking to the pastor eating barbecue, and suddenly the pastor looks at me, and out of the blue, he says this. And he says, Scott, I'm going to tell you something. He says, I've watched people in my church get too deep into motorcycles, and they, their personality gets hard. And then they backslide. He says, watch out for motorcycles. Now, that doesn't go over real big with a lot of Christians, but it's true. There is a Sultan cult, this Harley Davidson cult coming about. Come on, folks. There is a certain attitude that gets on there. The independence. That will start to affect your conscience, okay? And you start hanging out with that crowd, it will harden and change your personality. And this is from a pastor who is right on target with it all. So I don't want this church to become a, a, a motorcycle a groupie club. You can have your own motorcycles, you go out on your own, that's fine. But I don't want you to everybody start fellowshipping around motorcycles. I don't hear any enthusiasm, <laughs> but you're going to have to, it's not popular, but you're going to have to follow my lead, okay? Because I know so many pastors, okay, that are addicted. Right now, they're totally drooling at the mouth to get their cycles out of storage right now because of the spring weather. Hey, I like motorcycles. I used to have a dirt bike. For years, we go into an empty field and survey it out, start building different motorcycle tra uh, uh, motocross tracks there, and the jumps and everything, and being Evil Knievel. It's funny, it's, his name is Evil Knievel, huh? And if you don't, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, I will take you to Bikers Week, okay, in Daytona Beach, where I've been there for many times to do evangelism, and I'll show you what goes on in Bikers Week down there, and tell me that is the spirit that you want to bring into your church. Because what happens next is then the leathers start coming out, and you start dressing hard, you start acting hard, okay, and then the tattoos start coming. Let me feel the love out there. Come on. Amen. I'm telling you, this pastor told me, I'm, you got to hear it. This man of God looked at me, okay? And he looked at me and says, watch out, because I've seen people in my church, their personality change with that whole biking scene. He had no idea what was going on. Thank God for his warning. Amen. Amen. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Okay, let's use a different example, okay? Maybe a tennis league, okay? How about a soccer league, okay? I've been invited many times with my background as trying to play professional soccer to go play for this uh, adult men's team over here. They need somebody in my position. Whenever I see the guy, oh yeah, why don't you, you know what's going to happen? If I start playing that again, guess what's going to happen? 
My conscience, my personality will have a little bit of a change. You know why? That competitive mode will get back inside of me. A little bump and run, a little slide tackling, come on. And don't tell me you can be a Christian on those type of, you can't. We're so deceived, we think that all these professional football players are angels that call themselves Christians. They're out there helping the kids and helping the poor, working for the United Way, okay? Then on Sunday morning, go out there and totally obliterating, knocking people, ringing people's bell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> About the only place you could really be a Christian on the football field is if you're a kicker. Because you kick and you run off the field as fast as you can. <laughs> Folks, I'm talking about our conscience. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Getting really quiet. Amen. Well, let's open it up. Come on. Verse 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. So you're going to have to build some perseverance inside of you with your conscience and not give in to evil influences, and then the signs and wonders will come. Because if the signs and wonders came before that character development, it'll mess you up for life. And we've seen that happen many times before. Verse 20, I'm going to get to verse 20. I'm afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish, and may be found by you not to be what you wish, that perhaps there may be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, and disturbances. Now, that is the final thing the devil will throw at us in the transitional period. Because all he has left to throw at you is that and the kitchen sink, okay? Okay? That's it. So you know when strife and angry tempers and division are being thrown at you, okay? You know that you're coming out of a transitional phase with great victory. Hallelujah. Let's read about this. First Timothy. Excuse me, Second Timothy, chapter two. And verse 23. How y'all doing out there? If you only knew how many pastors that, have, that drive Harley, Harley Davidson's now, that are now turning their services. Seeker sensitive or become hard in their character. And I can go through the list, the list, 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 yep. and list. Yep. That's, amen. That's the truth. I'll be kind tonight. I won't go any further into that. <laughs> you can do it on your own, but I'm telling you, folks. You don't want to get involved in anything that's going to change your personality. Hello? Amen. When I want to use my talents for God, okay, what's your talent? Well, I've been learning, you know, Persian belly dancing. Shut down, <laughs> sit down, shut up, please. Amen. What? Amen. what? <laughs> well, I've got to attract young people by coming in and driving a big brand new Harley, you know, up on, on, on front of the stage, you know, and being cool and sit on a bike and preach, you know, I mean, come on, what, what's, what's happened to our culture? And what, what, you know what the biggest thing I don't like about it is that God's name, name is blasphemed even more among the heathen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Why has that happened? Because the shepherds are lowering the bar. We're in the last days, brothers and sisters. Amen. I plan on running and finishing this race. How about you? Amen. And so it says in chapter 2 and verse 19, let's, let's talk about this. Nevertheless, the firm foundation, say firm foundation, firm foundation, of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. I cannot read that scripture and go home tonight in a good conscience and turn on American Idol or other nonsense program as on just mainline TV, okay, and not feel hypocritical. I just pray some people get 
that are listening, okay, there are people that we know, that they get so tired of the pig pen of sin and wake up and say, it's better in my father's house. Hallelujah. Remember what God says about women? He says it's not so much putting on the outward jewelry and all the clothes. He says it's the beauty of the inner man. Amen? Come on, folks. Amen? Our culture is it's so much. You know what's bad when our culture elects a president by what he looks like? Our culture puts so much a high price, you know? Look at all, how many... Plastic surgeons are exploded just here in North Atlanta. I mean, I'm not, just understand what I'm saying, okay? What about the inner man? I don't care how much hair coloring you use. You're going to get gray eventually, okay? (laughs) Amen? I mean, what I'm trying to say is that let's concentrate on the inner man, amen? Amen? And the purity of the inner man, hallelujah, that we walk, ooh, glory, we walk like a Holy Ghost virgin. <laughs> now, before I read this, we need to read this. Go with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 and verse, excuse me, Romans 16 and verse 18. Now, I'm going to say this to you all before I read the scripture. Sisters, beware, because when I'm out there in the world witnessing, okay, and traveling, there is some really weird men out there, okay, that the only reason they come to church is because they want to find a woman. The verse, that was for somebody, moving right along, okay, verse 18 of chapter 16. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. Watch out for the roll on the belt buckle, okay? Uh Uh-huh. And by their smooth and flattering speech. Folks, come on, it's not about just working out. It's by controlling what you eat. Hello. Flattering speech that deceived the hearts of the unsuspecting. May we never be known as people that are unsuspecting at Glory Oasis. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I'm rejoicing over you. I want you to be wise in what is good, innocent in what is evil, and the God of Shalom will soon crush Satan under your feet. How about that for spiritual warfare? Just living a, a pure lifestyle. Oh, Scott, have you seen that new movie? What movie? Yeah. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Amen. Come on, brother. You need to get up to date. What? Up to date with what? The spirit of this world? I like a clean conscience where every demon in the region knows I'm waking up in the morning. Hallelujah. Red alert, red alert. He's up. Uh, 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 uh. Quick, get people to call him on the cell phone so he won't blow that show far this morning. Uh, uh. <laughs> and I'll be getting up and I say, oh, Lord, a day in your courts is better than a thousand intents of wickedness. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house, Lord. Oh, I worship you. Hallelujah. But ding, 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 ding. That's my cell phone. That's the devil. That is the devil. I ain't changing for that thing. No way. <laughs> You have mail. What? That's the devil. (laughs) How about that for spiritual war? Innocent. And what is evil? And don't think I'm dreaming this stuff up. But you can just ask this brother here who went to a quote, quote, revival Bible school. And he'll tell you what's going on there. (laughs) 
he used to call me, crying out because he was being swayed by a gravitational pull, a riptide. Come on. And you have to stand your ground. Is that because we're holier than anybody else? Think we're more righteous, okay? Because we passionately love him, amen? And also I like the sound of demons crunching underneath my feet. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And folks, I can't stick my neck out, man. I get, get, I don't want the devil to blow me apart, man. Stuff what we're doing, counterterrorism and stuff like that. I don't have time to compromise. Amen. Whoa. Second Timothy, as we conclude the night. Trying to equip you guys for battle. And the best equipment is to have a clean conscience. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the mystery of godliness, folks. And I just, you know, I, I just, I ask, go on a TV fast. Go on a cable TV fast. Go on an entertainment fast for a while. And tell me not if you sleep better at night. Your body is healthier. Hallelujah. You're, you're more th clear. You have more energy. Hallelujah. You, <laughs> you, you're clean. You can hear God's voice quicker. Ooh, come on. Hallelujah. Right. I want to get you to a place that God blesses you like you could never imagine. Hallelujah. And most... I would say two-thirds, maybe 60%, maybe 50% of the people grabbing this message right now are the sisters. Where's all the men? Well, they're starting to come about. I'm going to encourage you. They're starting to come about. Amen. Okay? Because they all went through the promise keepers phase, right? Yeah. And they all go and sing Amazing Grace with 80,000 men in, the, in a football stadium, okay? Come back and say, wasn't that great? I'm going to keep my promise. And they haven't kept their promise, so promise keepers fell apart because nobody could keep their promise, okay? So now godly sorrow is working in them, Okay? Yeah. I don't hear promise keepers for women. Did you know that our last election, I remember watching Peter Jennings, okay, have a heart attack almost on election night that did the exit polls that the majority of women that voted, they were surprised so many women voted for Bush, and they, they voted for him. They said, they asked him, was it because of the, the war? Was it because of counterterrorism? They said, no, the main reason we voted was because of morality. And did you know that our Supreme Court, folks, come on, they're about to hear arguments now about partial birth abortion, and we're about to see if we'll just continue to pray that none of those people become Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that we elected, or that we prayed for to become nominated to the court system, okay? Especially Kennedy. Pray for Kennedy. Pray for him, okay? Partial birth abortion can be stopped, okay? Now what's going to eventually make it through the circuit, okay, the Court of Appeals, is the... <laughs> Glory to God, I like this governor of South Dakota who has declared abortions, you know, against the law. Yes. So that's going to make its way to the Supreme Court. Come on, folks. And what are we going to do? Keep calling this little thing a fetus? You deliver, you see babies all the time. Are they little fetuses? They're people. Innocent. And our culture is so hard about it. Come on, folks. What's the difference between a Nazi concentration camp, come on, and an abortion factory down the street? What's the difference? We are the light of the world. Put it this way. What does that mean? We are the salt. What does that mean? We're the conscience of the nation. The cloud is moving. We're in transition. Wow. How many people want to be part of the new thing? Okay. Clean up your conscience. Get it squeaky clean. 
get out the Windex until it squeaks and you put that <laughs> squeegee across it and you'll be, ooh. Verse 19, having this seal, let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if a man cleanses himself from these things, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith. There's no walking here, folks. It's run away and run to. It's not when I feel like it. Amen. I don't want to get around to it. Now, move it double time. <laughs> Faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord from what? A pure heart. Okay, there's three levels of people in our lives. There's the 12 we hang around, okay? Okay, and then there's, glory to God, the 70, and there's the multitude. You don't share your secret heart with the multitude, okay, because they'll turn on you. The 70 you're supposed to call to equip, push them forward, but they're not your inner council of people. Then there's the 12, okay? You all with me? And it's always good to come back to a home ground like this place where people have the same pure heart, same objective, amen? Glory to God. Verse 23, now... This is the warning tonight, and I'm, I apologize for going so long, but we want to put it all together, the road map, amen? Glory to God. I'm the kind of person, I just don't like doing a map quest and find out how to get there. I want to see, open up the big globe and see every stop, okay? <laughs> see the whole terrain. Verse 24, verse 23. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations because they produce quarrels. Or another translation says they gender strife. Now, we have studied before that they get, there's two women. Have you all remember when I preached about that, the two women? There's Proverbs 8, which is the portal to heaven. Woman, the wisdom. And then there's the evil woman, right, which is the portal, the gate to hell. Okay? And then James takes those two wisdoms and says, you know, where there's selfish ambition and strife, there's every demonic work, right? But the wisdom from above is first pure, okay? So purity is the gate to the heavenly wisdom, okay? And strife and division is the gate to the regions of the damned. And we are forbidden to, to inoculate ourselves with speculation. Now, listen, Rush Limbaugh, talk radio, all this stuff, most of it's speculation, okay? You drive around and see so many houses around here built on specs, speculation, okay? What I'm trying to say to you is that speculation is what drives the markets, what drives our economy. Okay, speculation. Now, let's deal with what in terms of here. When you're in a situation, you can only go by the facts, like Char- Sergeant Joe Friday. Just the facts, ma'am, please. <laughs> okay? Because it's their opinion, his opinion, but what's God's opinion? Amen? And, you know, I don't care what you feel or what you feel like God said to you. What's, these are the facts, okay? So if we can stay with the facts, okay, what people say or what they do, then we can deal with situations. Amen? Notice what I said in Second Corinthians uh, chapter 4. That Satan is the god of this world. Remember when I taught on that? And the word for world there is age, which means the floating mass of thoughts, maxim, speculations. So Satan's territory is speculations, okay? And he will come into your mind and try to, well, did God really say? All right? Satan loves the gray areas. Folks, it's black or white in the Bible. Okay? So... We're commanded here to stay away from speculations because they produce quarrels. Like right now, I'm dealing with a pastor overseas that, you know, has looked at some type of film that said that 911 was planned by the Bush administration, okay? And I'm going to try to encourage him and say, listen, it's speculate. Even if, it, even if he did plan it, what can we do? What are we supposed to do? Go preach against it? I mean, come on. You're getting into the bait of Satan, Okay? Yep. 
and do a speculative area and, and conspiracy theories and all the other stuff, okay, is fodder for the devil. Amen? So if somebody says something about you or does something to you, the Bible says go to your brother. Don't go to the telephone and call somebody else you want to talk to. Because then speculation breeds, okay, and starts developing. And then a stronghold comes, okay? So we deal with speculations. We have nothing to do with it, okay? Verse 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, okay? You're going to have to, any type of pugnacious in, inside of you, whether it be your Scottish blood or your Irish blood or your Italiano, okay? Or <laughs> It's funny how every, every, uh, <laughs> Ethnic group has their excuse for anger, you know. <laughs> well, you're just getting my dandruff. You're getting that Cherokee Indian inside of me going. You've broken up my Irish blood. Shut up. Repent. Okay. Don't let. See, if you're walking in a pure conscience, okay, and in the weakness of, you know, which is the strength of Christ, but weakness to man, that when somebody hit, slaps you, you turn the other cheek. Don't engage in the argument. It's Satan's bait. Come on, folks. Okay, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong. So what I'm teaching, you should be able to teach also. Every person here should be able to teach. Amen? And if you feel you have a word from God, well, tell me or tell Roger and we'll release you. Come on, amen? amen. I don't have any of those ever come up to us. I have, to, I have to have a word. Well, tell me what your word is, you know. Let's get you activated. Amen. Anyway, moving right along. Come on, folks. You just can't sit there and enjoy being fed all the time. You've got to give out yourself, too. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Patient when wronged. Here we go. This is what we got to work on. Remember I told you, prophetically, I see on the horizon, coming against us as a group, coming against the church, is a wave of insults, okay? And we're going to have to go through certain things, divisions, strife, angry temperature, all these things that are coming against us, either from other Christians or from the world, whatever's going to happen, we're going to have to learn to flow with it and not get caught up in it. Okay? We're going to hit some turbulence here. Get your seatbelts fastened. Return your trays upright position, okay? And this is the purpose we've been drinking. The flight attendant's coming through the aisle picking up all the drinks right now. Quickly! <laughs> We're about to hit some turbulence here, okay? This is Satan's last attempt, blowing everything, including the kitchen sink at us to get us out of a place of faith. Because when you're in strife and division, your faith don't work, your love walk ain't working, you're useless. Okay, so what do we do? Verse 25, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. You can only be gentle to somebody if you're not demanding your own right. Correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Notice here, God may not grant repentance to some. There are some people that love to get angry, that love to get in strife, that are pugnacious in character already. And there may be a point where God says, that's it. I wash my hands of the person. They love their strife. They love their complaining. They love this. That's it. We need to pray that like Moses, oh God, forgive him. Pardon him, Lord. That God may grant them repentance, okay? Leading to the truth. And they may come to their senses, escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. How y'all doing tonight? Doing good. Doing Duped by evil influences, okay? Come on, let's read this again. Held captives, duped by evil influences, to numb the conscience, confuse the senses, paralyze the will, okay? But folks, that is just the precursor to what's about to happen. It keeps on going, it gets worse. 
but realize this in chapter 3, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal. How about this? Haters of good. Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now this is the most scariest part here. Holding a, you think these people are total pagans, heathens. But no, they have a form of godliness. Although the night is power, avoid such men as these. The Greek word is run away in horror. So we need to go out there and reach the world, amen? But there is a group of people that act like they're Christians, they probably used to be Christians, they probably could still be Christians, that are in this downward spiral, okay? And the Bible says they have a form of godliness from such run away, treat them like you would a, a horror house, okay? Run away in horror, okay? Because these are the people that are to cause us the greatest problems in this transitional phase. Let God grant them repentance, Okay? And gentleness did with them, but to keep moving forward. Don't get locked horns with them. Okay? I'm telling you, folks, you got to watch out for landmines. And these landmines, okay, are strife and division. People, I, I get baited all the time. I'll send out emails, you know. As you know, my emails are not seeker sensitive, okay? And, and I'll get people will bait me. I see it all the time. They bait me to argue. And a few times I've taken that bait and we get into the thing. And I'm like, well, I just wasted my time with these people. Hit the delete button. Amen. That's right. yep. That's now, when you go out street witnessing next week when we come out together, you're going to meet people that just want to debate or argue, okay? And the book of Proverbs says if you're in the presence of a foolish man and they discern no words of wisdom, depart from that man. Don't spend a lot of time debating with people, Okay? The devil has planted time wasters there to get us wasting our time because he knows he doesn't want us to reach the people that are ready. Now let's keep on going, folks. Verse 6, among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women. This is the driving force of daytime talk show. <laughs> no names mentioned. Okay, now why does the devil going after the weak women? Because he's afraid of your army ability. Because you're the ones hearing that God's doing something new and the cloud is moving. Oh, hallelujah! Led on by various impulses, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janies and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected as regarding the faith. But they will not make further progress for their folly be of obvious to all, that also those who came to be. Okay, listen, folks. We're going to start knowing the good tree from the evil tree. We're going to know them by their fruit, doesn't matter how much they prophesy. Amen. We're going to know them by their conduct and their godly character. Okay? Now, you all have a mission before we leave tonight, okay? There was uh, a man from this area that came to me, a couple guys, and uh, came to tell me about their pastor that had fallen into adultery and whatever, okay? And they're telling me, what should we do, you know, and this and that. And I looked at him, I says, gentlemen, this did not happen overnight. Let's take this as a learning cue. Okay, what do we do? I says, why don't you look back two or three years, however long, the first time you've got a check in your spirit. That you notice that the pastor's attitude shifted about his wife or how he acted toward other women or you saw things he was saying. Come on, folks. That you, something just kind of grieved your spirit. If you track back to that moment, that's when you should have said something. That's when God was trying to show you to rescue that person. Okay? 
And so what you guys need to be doing is going throughout, that's not just in this congregation, but friends and relationships you know, when you see people starting to get involved in angry tempers and strife, come on. What, are you going to be there to just be their friend? You need to confront them in a spirit of gentleness and say, what you're doing, what you're saying is wrong. Because once they get further down the road, it's too late. Unless God sovereignly gives them repentance. So whether we're in the church or outside the church, we got lures on our fishing pole. We're fishers of men, folks, not keepers of the aquarium. Okay? I think the largest aquarium in the world here in Georgia is a sign <laughs> that the church has become keepers of the aquarium instead of fishers of men. But a bunch of words from heaven tonight. <laughs> You got to string them together on a necklace and start eating them like a kid. You had all those little candies you put on a necklace and just eat them all, you know. Get all that red and pink all over your hands and everything. <laughs> Hallelujah! Okay. Now, going on, it says, verse 10, but you followed my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions and sufferings, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured out of them, all the Lord delivered me. Here is verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly or in the mystery of godliness, the clean conscience, will be persecuted in Christ Jesus. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Get ready for all types of gimmicks, not just in the marketing world, come on, and the consumers, products out there, just so many gimmicks, you know what I'm saying? We should have discernment. God will give us discernment. I mean, all the money we have is God's anyway. He should have a say so on what we buy and what we don't buy, amen? amen. Hallelujah. listening to our message today to you. Perhaps you have a friend, perhaps yourself are sitting there and wondering, where would I go if I died today? We'd like to give you a great privilege of praying with us and leading you to a knowledge of Jesus the Messiah. The Bible says, if any man or woman would call upon the name of Jesus, they would be saved. The Greek word for saved is healed, delivered. It's a wonderful promise. You're there now in your automobile, perhaps at home listening. Go ahead and pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me of my sins. The Bible says, if anybody would call upon your name, they would be saved. I'm calling today, Lord, save me, forgive me, cleanse me, take all of my sins and cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. Father, I'm coming running home to you now. In your name I pray, amen. God bless you. We love you guys.